going to happen? I want corporations out of the government and I want people back in. I want peace rather than militarization. I want the top wealthiest Americans to be taxed higher and that money to go to education. I want economic justice. I want a greater regulation of the banks and the markets. I want my kids to have a job and health care. I want true democracy for the 99% of us who don't have it anymore. I want to see. We are the 99%. 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 Hey everybody and welcome to the Occupy Wall Street show. We've got a fantastic uh, surprise for you today. Our guest is uh, political commentator Sally Cohn. Welcome Sally. Uh, pleasure to be with you. <laughs> so, so nice to meet you. You know, um, I want to start at the beginning because I first discovered you on Twitter of all things because I'm really big into Twitter and um, I saw, I think it was, a, it was one of your tweets that caught my eye where you said, um, Oh my gosh, I can't believe my eyes, my uh, pro <laughs> Occupy Wall Street uh, article was on the front, of, front page of foxnews.com. Yes. So that caught my eye. I was like, whoa, a pro Occupy Wall Street? First of all, that there was a pro Occupy Wall Street <laughs> article on Fox News, and uh, that was pretty cool. So then I read it and I was like, wow, very impressed. Yeah, I'm a woman of, very, of many mysteries. Uh, yes. Yeah, no, I actually uh, am a regular columnist for. Uh, Fox News, among other outlets, and so mm -hmm. I've written, uh, and, and, you know, as a columnist, yeah. get to write whatever I think, uh, yeah. and so I uh, enjoyed writing a piece recently supporting Occupy Wall Street and trying to explain to folks uh, the reason for Occupy Wall Street, why it was doing what it was doing, and, and actually the main piece, the main point of the piece was to make the argument that at this point, this was early on when I wrote it, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what they're for, it just matters that they're against something and that that's bringing people together. Yeah. Uh, and I think it went on to uh, get 30, uh, you know, thousand Facebook likes, uh, over oh. a half million hits <laughs> uh, and growing. So, uh, that's a lot of likes. you know, well, it's, uh, it was a nice surprise for everyone. And I think it shows the resonance of mm -hmm. the message, both, you know, on, uh, on all sides of the aisle. Yeah. And since then, I've seen you you're on CNN and Fox News and where else? Maybe around, yeah, all over. So <laughs> on, we, the you, subway, on the subway, on the, <laughs> no, on the internet, <laughs> on the, not until yeah, now, yeah. only on TV. But um, you haven't always been a political commentator. So what did you do before that? And how did, uh, you, how did all this happen? So Bruce, for fifteen years or so, I was a community organizer, mm -hmm. uh, more of a behind-the-scenes person, helping grassroots organizations and grassroots leaders uh, find their voice, do what they wanted to do better. Uh, run their campaigns better, do their media work better, mm -hmm. and then knit them together to do more powerful work mm -hmm. at the national level. Cool. Uh, and it was very, very, very deeply rewarding work. And I'm still connected to that work and, and do some of that. Mm -hmm. But then I made a shift, uh, you know, sort of really frustrated with the times we were in. This is sort of post-Obama, post-Obama's election, frustrated that you know, on paper we won, right? Yeah. But in practice, the governing, guiding principles of the country were still largely determined by the right mm -hmm. wing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, continuing to sort of push our various political boulders up a hill, mm -hmm. when that hill was fundamentally shaped by the right, the <laughs> extremist far right, and has been for 30 years, uh, you know, felt like this sort of impossible Sisyphusian task. So instead, mm -hmm. I thought, well, what would it look like if I sort of played a different role and tried to change that public mm -hmm. conversation to, in effect, do what organizers do, uh, you know, in, in small groups and, and, you know, church halls and union halls and mm -hmm. do it instead through the media. Your media, for sure, yeah. Do you know who Lisa Fithian is? I do, yeah. yeah she was actually our guest uh, two episodes ago. She, uh, um, Our friend Daniel interviewed her, and it was fantastic. You have to check that out. Yeah. She's amazing. I, uh, You know, we've only actually met once, but I know she does amazing work uh, mm -hmm. and is a real resource and gem to yes. the movement. So yeah. it's, I look forward to that, yeah. For sure, for sure. So what have... Um, Let's see. Um, I w you know, there's uh, there 
it's been reported that unions and Soros and Move On and Acorn all have been behind organizing Occupy Wall Street. Uh, <laughs> who's really behind organizing Occupy Wall Street? Yeah, uh, you know, it's really, it's really funny, Bruce. The, um, uh, the defenders of the 1% and the uh, enemies of the middle class, really, mm -hmm. are throwing everything in the kitchen sink at the 99% movement because it is, in fact, so popular. And, and mm -hmm. not just uh, you know, among the traditional liberal left, but independents, uh, you know, the sort of Ross, Ross Perot, Ron Paul types, mm -hmm. a lot of Tea Party members, a lot of conservatives. Uh, last poll I saw, a third of conservatives support and endorse the Occupy movement itself specifically, mm -hmm. and a much mm -hmm. larger percentage agree with a lot of their critiques uh, about the system. Right? Right. So, you know, when you have something that is so popular and <laughs> represents such a fundamental threat to the status quo, to our ways of doing things, to the inequality that has been shoved down our throats right. for generations, uh, you got to try, you know, you're seeing everybody scramble mm -hmm. to make this movement look, oh, they're a bunch of fringe lefty radicals, they're unemployed kids, they're being paid to be there by Acorn. <laughs> I mean, come on. It's, yeah. it's actually just, um, apart from being pathetic, it would, be, it would be laughable if it wasn't so pathetic. Yeah. It's really just a sign of how successful uh, the movement is. Right. Like that, isn't it a quote, uh, was it Gandhi who said, uh, first they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's just so apropos because you can see at first they were just laughing and now they're getting serious and fighting and countering it. Yeah. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be very interesting. But don't you think though that the average person can, um, to me, it seems so obvious, but is it just me? <laughs> Don't you think that the average person can see them just throwing everything? Like you said, they're throwing everything at it. Every random thing they can think of, just hoping something will stick. Well, I, you know, I mean, look at McCarthyism. <laughs> I mean, this is what we've done in the history of we. I mean, the, not me, we, <laughs> not you, we, but we mm -hmm. uh, have done in the history of the United States when we want to distract from... Uh, a quote-unquote dangerous yeah. uh, political movement. Dangerous not because of its ideas or ideology, but dangerous because of its uh, proxim proximation to actual success and victory. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's no question. There's a group of people in America who are freaked out yeah. if they think, oh my gosh, these are Marxists or socialists yeah. or whatever other kind of ists have you. Yeah. Uh, but the reality is sort of twofold, right? So the reality is, yeah, some of them are. Mm -hmm. Some of them are Marxists and socialists. That's okay. I mean, mm -hmm. first of all, uh, you know, there was a poll recently that uh, almost a quarter of Americans, this was in 2009, almost a quarter of Americans uh, think capitalism doesn't work anymore in our country mm -hmm. and would prefer, would prefer an alternative like socialism. I'm presented mm -hmm. with the question that way. Wow. It's almost one in five. Now, I think that says less about people's support for socialism than it does with people's frustration with capitalism yeah. as we currently know it. As we currently know right. it, I mean, yeah. one in, uh, something like, uh, I want to say, seven in ten, uh, it was around there, seven in ten Americans said capitalism in its current form isn't working mm -hmm. in our country. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. it, it, so let's be clear, some of them are. Yeah. But most of them aren't. And the point yeah. is, if the critique is valid, who cares? Who cares if it's Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer still people and they're who's Americans, come right? down from the sky, started talking, and made some really valid points about mm -hmm. what's wrong with our economic system, how Wall Street is ruining our country and running our politics and shutting out ordinary Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, the, the, the critiques, the aberrations, the you know, random acts of violence, all of these things don't belie the fundamentally right and just mm -hmm. and resonant message of Occupy Wall Street. Exactly. And of course, the you know, media loves uh, hysteria and violence and things. Like you see uh, Occupy, Wall, Occupy Oakland, right? Where the, I've seen video on YouTube. You have to go to YouTube to get your news. It's so sad. But uh, where they had 20 or 30,000 people marching and all these families and little children and you know, seniors and everybody just so diverse. And it was like a, like a festive parade, really. It was just so masses of, of people. 
and people power marching all day for hours, right? But the only thing that makes the evening news is uh, somebody started a fire. Yeah. And, that, and apparently, the, the, later I read the story was that because the police were throwing tear gas, they, somebody lit a fire in a dumpster to, to burn off some of the fumes from the tear gas. But they laid, literally, apparently, the police in Oakland waited until there were no media around. Yeah. It was late at night, no media, the coast is clear, Well, the police attack. in Oakland are very savvy. Uh, I mean, mm. look, uh, first of all, uh, two things. No one should be condoning the violence that's happened. Right. There has been violence. You right. don't want to sugarcoat it. You don't want to paper it over. That's there, right. There have been assaults in the Occupy camps. There has been violence done to businesses and banks. This is true. Yeah. Uh, it hasn't been frequent. It hasn't been the norm. Uh, there have been a few aberrant activities that have been widely condemned right. by the rest of the protesters. But we don't want to sugarcoat it. Right. At the same time, you know, I think it's, it's very instructive to look a little more closely at what's happening in Oakland because Oakland has uh, a deep and very justified, I would note, uh, the Oakland community has a very deep and justified uh, longstanding tension, tense relationship mm -hmm. with the police, to put it very lightly, right? Yeah. The Oakland police are notorious for racial profiling, for um, abuse of force, for, I mean, just heinous, mm -hmm. heinous, uh, you know, for beating someone... To death because he didn't show his ID. I mean, these are mm -hmm. these are really long-standing issues with the Oakland police mm -hmm. that the Occupy movement has sort of mapped on top of. Right. It doesn't get rid of those underlying tensions. And so the fact that um, uh, the scene in Oakland exploded more than other sites, I think, mm -hmm. has more to do with that very justifiable and understandable history than it does the particularities mm -hmm. of the Occupy movement. That's kind of strange. I mean, I don't know that much about the Oakland area, but it, it seems to me it's like if the people are so uh, supportive and open-minded, apparently, and liberal and, and uh, supporting Occupy Wall Street and all that, like, like, isn't there any democracy there like, at all? Like, is it a police state? Does the mayor have any, uh, does, do the people have any power or responsibility for their own police force? I mean, can't they eject them and replace them, do something? Yeah, it's... I mean, Bruce, this is a, that's a more complicated conversation. I'm not going <laughs> to pretend to be an expert on Oakland. I think, you know, generally around the country, um, generally around the country, uh, you know, in small towns and big towns, the, your relationship to the police force, in, in general, your relationship to power and authority, but particularly your relationship to the police force, uh, is often determined more by your class and your race than it is by the particularities of that police force, whether it's accountable or not. So, uh, you know, in New York, right, I'm white, I live in a nice neighborhood, if something goes wrong, I call the police. The police right. are on my side. Yeah. I perceive them to be on my side. My yeah. life experience tells me that they're on my side. When mm -hmm. I pass a police officer, our interaction mm -hmm. confirms they're on my side. Right. Uh, but if I'm a young, you know, black man, and something happens, am I gonna call the police? Well, I've been, you know, stopped and frisked for no good reason. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I've been walking down the street and looked at by a police officer like, you know, are you suspicious? Are you doing anything wrong? Are you? I've experienced in my life the police more as a, um, uh, an oppressive force right. than a liberating or, or, or saving or helping force. So mm -hmm. uh, in Oakland, I think that's very, very much the, the, the history mapped on top of, you know, I mean, uh, you know, patterns of, political unrest, mm -hmm. uh, and a police force that, frankly, you know, has never been effectively reined in mm -hmm. by the political system, right. um, you know, in a way that maybe now we'll start to see. But it's worth noting, incidentally, that mm -hmm. it was only after a white mar er, marine, marine, vet, marine, yeah. marine vet, I don't mm -hmm. want to get the wrong branch, you mm -hmm. get in trouble for that, mm -hmm. uh, marine vet was injured by the Oakland police, yeah. that it became a national story, whereas the many, 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 many uh, people of color who have been injured or killed by the Oakland police have not generated that sort of attention. So no. it, it has really to do with that discrepancy. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, on that note, let's take a break real quick and uh, thank our sponsors because uh, obviously without our sponsors we wouldn't be here. So um, first we want to thank Mt. Gox. We were talking about Bitcoin earlier before we, before we started and Bitcoin is the, uh, the money of the future. We call it the, I say it's the most interesting, exciting technology inventions since the internet itself. Bitcoin is the um, electronic digital 
cash, in effect, a uh, currency that is completely distributed peer-to-peer -peer, um, based on open source software. It's not distributed by any bank or any government or entity, corporation, website, group of guys, nothing like that. It's just literally peer-to-peer -peer software. Mt. Gox, though, is a company. Mt. Gox is the number one Bitcoin exchange, the online yeah. exchange. There are dozens of online exchanges, but Mt. Gox has like a at least 90% market share. They're uh, reliable, long-standing. They've been around. They've been hacked. They've been through all kinds of problems, but uh, they've come out uh, on top. Ahead, on top, right. Nobody lost any, any Bitcoin, so um, they're in it for the long haul, and they're profitable, so they're not going away. Now, do they pay for their sponsorship in dollars or Bitcoins? <laughs> uh, Bitcoin, actually. Okay, that's yeah. interesting. Just but curious. It's, that's the thing. It's convertible. That's the, what Mt. Gox does. That's, Mt. Mt. Gox site lets you sell Bitcoins for dollars and uh, buy Bitcoins with dollars, and 16 other currencies, by the way. Ah. Yeah, they're headquartered in Japan, and we're gonna, we have a, another show called The Bitcoin Show. It's a whole other show, literally. But, uh, but Mt. Gox is a, a fantastic operation and makes it so convenient so that you can buy and sell Bitcoin from the comfort of your own home online without having to go anywhere. Very so, cool. Very cool, yeah. And now they have a mobile app uh, which, uh, for Android, and they're working on one for iPhone. So really slick. So check it out, mtgox.com. We thank Mt. Gox for sponsoring the uh, Occupy Wall Street show. And... The Thank You Economy Book. It's thankyoeconomybook.com. Uh, Thank You Economy Book is by uh, New York Times bestselling author Gary Vaynerchuk. And this book is about social media. It's a, uh, how do I explain it? Um, it's about taking your business, whether it's a small startup or a very large business, it's a scalable uh, method to bringing your business back to the old days, when, when you gave, like your grandparents' mm -hmm. days, when businesses gave you personalized customer service. Yeah. And so it's leveraging the new technologies of social media in the right way. Because like, <laughs> speaking of 99%, 99% of businesses do it wrong. They get on Twitter and they, they Facebook and they spam you and they're annoying and it's, it does, it's not, not done right. But if you do it right, you can actually build, uh, not just make a sale, but you can make a customer relationship for life and, and really make, uh, you know, be, have success uh, that is sustainable. So it's all about uh, using social media and leveraging that technology to really satisfy your customers. So it's called the Thank You, uh, Thank You Economy, thankyoeconomybook.com. So th thanks for supporting the Occupy Wall Street show. And so click here to continue to part two of this show.